over 50 years of orthopedic experience in joint replacement, arthroplasty, resurfacing, whatever you want to call it, but we're going to answer all those questions tonight. Before we get started, a few acknowledgments. First of all, this educational center you're sitting in, what a beautiful auditorium. This building has 70,000 square foot of educational venues. Above you, there are simulated ORs, there are simulated ICU rooms, hospital rooms, cadaver rooms. Everything that you could think about to teach our colleagues, our medical students, anybody in healthcare. It's wonderful. It opened in February. It's nicer than any educational center I've been at in my career at some of the major hospitals in big cities. Um, I'll second that. I was, I've been here a lot doing meetings, and it almost feels like Star Trek compared to my medical school. I went to Temple. You went to Jeff, right? Jeff. I mean, it's, it makes Temple look prehistoric. I mean, literally, I feel like when I walk into the OR upstairs, it's an OR. And when I walk into an ICU, ICU room upstairs, it's an ICU room. So the medical students, nurses, nurses in training, they're going to all come through here and they're going to train there. They have a blood draw lab. It's, it's, it's one of the, if you, if you can, see if you can take a tour because it's really impressive. Because we're going to bring a lot of education through this building, really. You, you know what I like the most about it? This room. And you know why? Because I could sit here, just like we do in the office, and look you square in the eye, person to person, and answer questions. I'm calling the old fashioned, but you know what? There's a lot of digital stuff out there, Google, but I like this. I like looking at people, seeing people, hearing the questions. There's no virtual reality. He's real. He's not an avatar. We're here. We're going to answer the questions. So I want to thank. Lehigh Valley for helping us put on the first Lehigh Valley Orthopedic Institute seminar. Eric and I have done a lot of these, but this is the first one put on by the Orthopedic Institute. And you might ask, what the heck is Lehigh Valley Orthopedic Institute? How does that differ from the orthopedic department? And I'm going to bounce that back to Dr. Levy to explain. Excellent, excellent. And I'd like to thank everybody, first of all, all you guys for coming. It's 5.30 on a on a Wednesday, get my days mixed up because the OR, we're so busy. But I'd like to thank the, the whole staff that's here today, um, the marketing team, Joe Schomburg, one of our, our, our head administrator who I saw in the audience. So it's great to be together again, right? Back in 2020, we were locked in our, in our rooms, right? And now we're in person again, and it's, it's so great to be with you guys. And I, I, like Tom, really like contact, patient contact, because that's what it's all about. If we're not here talking to you and we're not talking to our patients, then we're not doing our jobs. So institute, everybody hears that word, it's a big word, institute. What's, it, what's the orthopedic institute? What's the Lehigh Valley Orthopedic Institute? That's a lot of busy words up there, so I'm really not going to mention one of those words. I'm going to explain it to you differently. You can read the board if you want, but here's what an institute is, like what I envision the orthopedic institute. Say I said to you, Let's say I said to you, I want you to go shop for a baseball cap. I want you to shop for a tennis racket. I want you to shop for a football. And I want you to have a wonderful steak dinner. Are you going to go to the Westgate Mall? No. Are you going to go to the Lehigh Valley Mall? Maybe. You're going to go to Target? Maybe. I, myself, I would go to the King of Prussia Mall, right? Because you can get anything from jewelry to a teddy bear to a baseball cap to a xylophone, a violin, a guitar, and you can go out for a great steak dinner at Capitol Grill right there at King of Prussia Mall, right? That's what I envision our institute as. We have everything for you, everything for your family, everything for, your, from, for, the, for the little kids, to the athletes. Just to put things into perspective, our new physician in chief, who's our new lead, right? I used to be the chief of the division, but now we're an institute, and we have a chief of our institute, and it's Dr. Thomas Graham. He takes care of professional athletes. He's taken care of over 2,000 professional athletes. One of his best friends was Arnold Palmer. So we're going to have a lot of things going on at the institute. We're going to have a lot of athletes coming. We might be you know, team doctors for some professional teams now. Not, not, not to say that the pigs aren't great to be with, the phantoms aren't great to be with, but there's going to be a lot that you're going to see in this community in the future. And I want you guys 
and I want you to spread the word to think of us as the Lehigh Valley, not as the Lehigh Valley Orthopedic Institute, but we're kind of like the King, King of Prussia Mall. You can get anything. And from A to Z, from joint replacements to spine to pediatrics to sports, and not just injuries and surgeries, but also prevention. There's gonna be a lot of, of leadership activities that we're gonna be doing uh, in the community. Um, we're going to, you're gonna see us, we're gonna be out there. Uh, orthopedics in medicine, it's, it's kind of, it, more than anything else, orthopedic touches you guys more than anything else. Yeah, we get sick, yeah, we go to the doctor, but more times than not, what brings you to the doctor? A sore joint, a sore shoulder, a sore elbow, you know, a sports injury, uh, a weekend warrior injury, and you're gonna be coming to us. And if you're not treated like the King of Prussia Mall, like your experience at the King of Prussia Mall, let us know, because that's what we envision in the future. Now, if you wanna read the busy slide, you can, but, but that's my vision of, of what our institute is. One last thing, imagine a baseball team, right? Imagine just the players. How's that team gonna do? if it's just the players, right? No trainers, no um, announcers, no vendors. It's a, it's, a, it's a whole process. So the doctors like us, we're kind of the baseball team, but we have guys like Joe Schomburg. We have um, a ton of people helping us to make us what we are. So you're not a team without everyone working together. So great, Eric, and, and I wanna give kudos to um, Dr. Lemmy, because it's taken a big load off of our shoulders. To summarize that, we have more assets at our control. And you know what that does for you? It brings value to you. It brings better care, innovation, research, and technology. You know who did that before we had an institute? This guy, when he was chief of the division. I was president of a big orthopedic group. But you know when we did it? We did it at night, and we did it on the weekends. I'll give you two examples. Robotic technology is awesome. But we didn't have an institute a couple years ago, and Eric and I got together one night, and we realized that robotics now has reached a stage where we should bring it in. We did this at night and on weekends, and right now we've done thousands of robotic surgeries. Eric and I were interested in nutraceuticals. How do supplements help patients? These are things that we have a personal interest in. We would do it in talks at night on the weekends, but now we have other assets just like this, which is why you are here. So anyway, that's the value to you of an institute. So um, just a couple comments before we get into the meat of this. Oh yeah, we have to say this. Whatever you hear tonight is not medical advice. This is just the opinion of Dr. Levy and my. It's not medical advice. Lehigh Valley makes us put this up there, but I think it's appropriate. We're not telling you what to do. Any advice you have to get from, you know, from your own doctor. So we put that disclaimer up. So Total joint arthroplasty. Tom, you're the second from the left or the, the third? <laughs> I'm the spear guy, but the you're spear the guy. I'm, I'm ahead of you. You're the guy ahead of me with the computer. I'm just sort of a, I'm from the coal regions. We still use picks and shovels and stuff. You guys use computers. But, but anyway, this is sort of a slide that we'll start with. So the evolution of when we started years ago, I mean, it's at warp speed now, but when Eric and I started, you were in the hospital for seven days. You had- and you might've gone to rehab after that. What, pardon? You might've gone to rehab after the seven days. So, yeah, hospital. that's the second line here. Right, yeah. So oh, I didn't know. Eric doesn't read. If he just read, read the darn the thing, he really would see don't. that. So rehab, he's getting ahead of me. So we went to rehab, we gave everything everybody narcotics, morphine pumps, there was no supplements like you had, you know, CPM drains, long incision, bone loss, and somehow if we fast forward, we could actually do this with hospital stays less than 23 hours. Rehab has changed, rehab is wonderful, but now we could do it online, we could do it in-house, we could do it a whole bunch of different ways. We could do it with minimal or no narcotics, smaller incisions, minimal bone loss, less pain. How do we do that? How can we do operations, get people home the same day, or a few hours. We're gonna go over that with you. But he and I have given so many talks over the years, and look it, we're almost 15 minutes into this and you haven't had a chance to ask a question. So what we find is we could take any one of these topics or these topics and talk about it for, for an hour. hour. And then we have question and answers and you get three questions at the end and time's up. So we decided to design this night completely different. We're not gonna talk for an hour because we could pick any one topic. We want you 
to pick the topics. And we're going to start question and answers right now. So let's but, play stump the chump. But I do talk too much. So I'm going to say one more thing before I let it go. So when Eric and I give an answer, do you know where that answer comes from? It comes from our, ed our education and our training, our fellowship, what we've read in scientific literature of the years, but most, most important is our experience. <clears throat> and one of our pet peeves is misinformation. And there's a ton of misinformation out there. You're too young for total joint replacement. You can't kneel on it. You're, need antibiotics the rest of your life after dentist. Joint replacement only lasts 10 years. Only lasts 10 years. Well, you know what? Almost nothing in orthopedics hasn't changed. And so we never hang our, when people come in and they say that, we say it's our opinion, but you have to be humble enough to know things will change. So any, if you ask Eric and I a question tonight, you might get two different answers because we do have a little different experience. That doesn't mean we're right or wrong, but we're honest in our own opinion. So I, with that preface, I want to open it up. Yeah, I think it's a great idea. And so this night is this night is really for you guys. I mean, who wants to hear two guys laugh? first? And if you don't ask a question, we'll keep talking. What is a non-narcotic protocol? So you want me to start that? Go ahead. So go back to that slide with evolution. The evolution slide. Back here, you know, these years. And even up to around 2010, not necessarily purposefully, but a lot of the drug problem was because of the physician and healthcare providers, right? Because we were told, hey, it's okay. You know, here's a new drug, Oxycontin, all these new drugs. They're great, they're great for pain and given the patients for pain. So when I started, we would give like a three month supply right, of, of narcotics to people. And what we were doing, we were creating addicts. And what we didn't realize was that you don't need that three months, you don't even need a bottle, you know? And, and it, was, it was a culture for, for treating pain. And the patients became part of the culture. They needed the medication, we, they, we would have to give it to them. And what we found over time is we needed less and less and less and less. And I did a study with, I was part of a study at the hospital where we did a decreasing narcotic protocol uh, where instead of giving even 30 tabs, we would give like seven tabs, seven pain pills to go home with. And the patients did very well. You're absolutely right. You know, somebody hits you with the, the strongest pain medication that you can is one of them is Dilaudid. You know, and it doesn't even work for some people. Um, there are, there, there's something, and Tom will probably talk about this too, there's something called multimodal pain control. You know, you, we have to start attacking pain before you hit the front door, right? So Tom and I talk about nutraceuticals, putting people on omega-3s before they even go into the hospital, right? That's nature's best anti-inflammatory. And I know Tom and I love to talk about nutraceuticals. We can do that all night. But there are different ways to hit pain. And, you know, he has a pain protocol. I have a pain protocol. They differ a little bit. Um, and they might even differ a lot, but they both work. And what both of our protocols do is we use much less narcotics, much less long-lasting narcotics. You used to be, you know, in the hospital three days, partially just because of the narcotics that you were on, right? What do narcotics do? They slow our bowels down. Uh, they make us nauseous. We can't get out of bed. You get a, a, your, your bowels work slower and, and you become miserable. So the less narcotics that we give you, the better and quicker your rehab is. It's going to get to the point where we won't even give narcotics for the surgery we do. So your question relates to how they treated patients 30 years ago, where narcotics were the first line of treatment. Now they are the last line for only breakthrough pain. Dr. Lebby and I start our pain management a month ahead of surgery. So we preempt it with antioxidants and anti-inflammatories. You are on natural antioxidants for 30 days ahead of time with omega-3s, L-arginine, and anti-inflammatories. The day before surgery, we prep our patients with 3,000 milligrams of acetaminophen. When you come into the hospital, before an incision is made, you get um, an anti-inflammatory, you get Tylenol, you get a steroid, you get <clears throat> um, preemptive plan, you have TXA, which is a modern amino acid to decrease blood loss. In the operating room, you get a block. 
There is no narcotic given to our patients. They wake up in the recovery room. They're having coffee, juice, they walk and they pee. And they have no narcotics. Dilaudid is one of the strongest narcotics ever. And for the slide up here, that's why we don't do it. Very few of our patients take a narcotic post-operatively and we limit post-op. So there's a whole different pain management that we weren't taught when we went to medical school. We sort of learned it, but it's a great question. How long do the nerve blocks last? You can walk around in the recovery room. So our new blocks are so fancy. They are not motor blocks, they are sensory blocks. So, and it's not just one block sometimes. So we call the block the spinal. We don't do general anesthesia in the majority of patients. General anesthesia is the highest risk. We don't put a tube down your throat. We don't breathe for you. You're not on a ventilator. So you get a block in the lower lumbar spine, block number one. Some docs add a second block of the sensory nerve in the thigh. That can last a couple hours. We can put a block in the knee that lasts anywhere from six to eight hours to 48 hours, depending on the medicine. None of that numbs up the motor. So you could walk on it immediately. And on top of that, you had the multimodal pain medicine. So years ago, they had blocks where they did ephemeral block, you would fall down and you have to be in a hospital. So it's a whole picture of a multimodal pain management. Thank you. Yeah, I agree with that, except there is, a, I mean, for a couple hours, it's a motor block. So I was thinking of Exprol. Correct. So yeah. there's some medication that can last longer. But. You get a motor block. You're not going to be able to move for a couple hours. Um, but he is right. It's a lot more sensory now. And, you know, back in the day, those, that slide with the, with the ancient people, um, we used to do epidurals and we used to do femoral blocks, like he said, and you couldn't even walk. He is, I mean, you get up now and walk. If, whether you're, you're done as an outpatient or whether you're a 23-hour oh, so. stay, you're up walking the first day. And what he said, too, remember, it's the spinal plus the block in the knee, and then we inject inside the knee itself. So three different pathways you're getting pain control, and that's really, I think, it is. a big change from and the what's, past. See, what's great is when, when you had general anesthesia, you're asleep. But as soon as we make an incision, your body knows it's violated. Your heart rate goes up, your blood pressure goes up. And so how does anesthesia treat that? They give you narcotics. If we have a block, that pain message never gets above your spinal cord and you're happy as a lark in the OR. Your brain never knows it was hurt, so you don't need dilaudid. That's the whole difference. Can bone spurs be removed during surgery? It's expertise. Yeah. <laughs> I'm also a hip surgeon. I do hip and knees. So, um, the spur, yeah, when we're doing a hip replacement, the spurs are weak, the big word for that is osteophytes, bone formation. So what happens with arthritis, right? Arthritis is the degradation or the destruction of cartilage, right? We have, this is our hip joint, right? And that's the cup. And there's this space there, and that space is cartilage. Arthritis is when that cartilage disappears. So your body starts hurting. So what does your body do? It's an amazing thing. It produces bone. And why does it produce bone? because it doesn't want you to move that hip anymore. And that's why all of a sudden you can't lift your leg, you can't cross your leg, because that's your body's defense mechanism to try to prevent it from moving. So that's why your body creates those spurs. And it does so thinking it's helping, but it ends up hurting in the long run. So what we do is we remove those spurs that are around the head and neck. We just take the neck off and replace that neck with metal, plastic, and the type of liner, like a, a ceramic head, and, and that's what we do. But yes, we remove those spurs, absolutely. What recovery options are available if I live alone? There are actually some studies that say even people that are alone, that are very high functioning, actually do better going home than going to a rehab facility. There are plenty of studies. There was a great study at Rothman that, that showed this um, in 80 year olds, 80 plus year olds. Uh, that being said, if you don't have somebody that can help you and, and you're, you're really at a loss, you know, at Tillman and, and where, where Dr. Mead works, we have excellent, excellent caseworkers that will get you in a, in a facility, you know, as needed for you that best is suited for you before you go home. The bottom line is we're not going to send you home if you're not safe to go home. I don't care if you're 50, 60, 70, 80, or 90. If you're a 50 year old and you're not capable to go home, we're not gonna kick you out the door and push the gurney down the street and say, see you later. We're gonna make sure that you have the care that you need, whether it's home care, 
whether it's directly to outpatient therapy, whether it's what Dr. Mead said about the online therapy. Um, you know, I look at joint replacement surgery, whether it's hip or knee surgery, it's a recipe and we follow a recipe, right? But each person in that recipe is a custom part of that recipe. So you might have to add a little oregano or you might have to add a little basil or you might have to put it in the oven a little longer. You know, each person is part of that recipe, but the recipe is different for each person. And that's what we call fine tuning to each patient. You know, one patient might, you know, be an outpatient. One patient might need a three day stay. One patient might need a one day stay, but you can't just, it's not cookie cutter. It's, it's a very complex recipe. And that's our job to figure out where you fit in that, in that recipe. But I also say you're not a UPS package. We don't drop you off on the porch and say, good luck. Right. As Eric said, the criteria to go home has nothing to do medically. It has to do socially. And so a lot of times, you know, the prehab and the preparation beforehand gets you in shape to handle yourself. But you need someone at home with you for the first couple days. You don't need medical care, but we don't want 911 help. I've fallen and I can't get up. So to Eric's point, you need a care partner. I don't care if it's your friend, your neighbor. It can't be a dog or five cats. That does not work, but you need help. How do I know if I need a joint replacement? Can we actually give you a score so that we know where you rank? Do you rank an you are capable of going home. Do you need to be in the hospital one day? Do you need to be in the hospital two days? And a very small percent, less than 4% of the people ever have to go to a rehab facility. And it's not up to us. We're not in control of the world. Frankly, your insurance company and the rehab facility right. will come and evaluate you. You're welcome. Who is a candidate for robotic total joint replacements? Do what he wants yeah. to do it. So we'll both do it. I'll, yeah, I'll tell you. We'll give you different approaches on that since both of us brought robotic surgery to the hospital. But after doing tens of thousands of joint replacements over the years, you know what we're very good at? We're very good at evaluating new technology and who it benefits the most from. So now after doing hundreds and hundreds of robotic cases, we have to weigh the good with the bad. It takes a little bit longer. Not too much longer, but a couple minutes longer in the OR. So now we're extending anesthesia and we're extending the OR. And we're looking at our outcomes and the outcomes in the literature. And frankly, there's not a big difference in the literature of the outcomes between robotic and not robotic. But you know, we don't look to the literature like we said. We look to our experience. And I know which patients do better in my hands with the robot and which ones it's not worth the extra time. It's very precisely allowing us to put the parts in there, but I have patients that, in my case, are larger, have difficult deformities, can't bend all the way, and in those cases, the robotics help me enormously. And everybody, it might be 50-50. Yeah, I mean, I think everybody has a different idea of what robotic surgery is, right? Some people in here might think robotic surgery is, you know, Tom presses a button and, and the robot comes walking <laughs> in, you know, and the robot does the surgery. It's not the way it is. It's not, and it's not AI, right? We all hear that. That's a big word today, AI, artificial intelligence, right? So the robot, I always tell patients this, the robot is only as smart as the programmer, right? And if you know what you're doing, even when you know what you're doing, and this was my experience with the robot, and like Tom, I did hundreds. Um, but a lot of times the robot, even when I program in the right settings and, and get everything right, the robot still takes me down the wrong path, right? Now, as an experienced, or arthroplasty surgeon, I, whoa, this robot's wrong, it's not the right thing, and I, I'll abort or, or change. The danger of a robot is if you go to a surgeon who kind of isn't too experienced and just follows what the robot does, right? You know, a robot can go walk you off a cliff. Remember, here's a great example, the GPS systems in the cars. How many people use a GPS system, right? I gotta admit, they're much better today. But about 20 years ago, the first GPSs, it'll drive you off a cliff. I mean, and, 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 and a place that's 20 minutes away, it takes two hours to get there through the GPS, right? So the, the robot is, has a lot of great qualities. One thing that Tom didn't mention about the robot is in my elderly patients, you have to put pins, and some of the pins are pretty big. And in an older patient that has osteoporotic bone, remember softer bone or osteoporosis, everybody here osteoporosis? When you make those holes in the bone, you actually cause a weakness in the bone there. And there have been some studies and there's been shown that there's actually a risk of fracture. 
So that's where I absolutely won't use a robot. For now, what I do with the robot is if it's, like Tom said, a real difficult case, a lot of bone, not much motion, I like to use the robot there. If there's a lot of hardware in the knee, right? If you have a rod or some other surgery in your knee and I can't use standard equipment, then I definitely use a robot for that. But, you know, we've done a lot of cases the other way, and I've looked at the robotic cases versus my cases, and I found there's really not much difference at all. And I agree with him with the time factor, too. I hope that helped. How do you determine whether to do a robotic joint replacement? I determine in the office ahead of time by those criteria. Right. The size of the knee, the size of the deformity, the range of motion of the patient, the hardware in the knee, all those things together make us decide. And a lot of times a patient will come in and they'll, they'll have the robot book and they'll say, I want the robot. I'll say, I know how to do the robot, I'll do it. But I'd prefer not to, but if you want me to do the robot, I'll do the robot on you. It's, 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 it's not difficult. It's not, it, it's, but I think a lot of the robot is like anything else. It's marketing, a lot of it. I think 15 years from now, robotics is going to be totally different, you know, and I think there will be AI. And I could picture us like Star Trek sitting in the booth and, and watching the uh, program, the robot and watching the robot do the surgery. It's not the way it is now. It's really not. It's just it's I tell people it's another tool in my toolbox, the robot. I want to sit in the, in the booth and watch Eric do the surgery. That's what I want to do. That's my idea of a great robot. <laughs>